Good afternoon, church. My name is Randy Stearns. I am the assistant to the Bishop of the Ohio West area, and I bring you a greeting and welcome to those present here in this church, as well as those who are joining us via the live streaming. We are here in Westerville, Ohio at the Church of the Messiah, and uh, this service is the service of installation for the Episcopal ministry of Bishop Gregory Vaughn Palmer in the Ohio West area of the United Methodist Church. I wish to thank all those who have participated in this event, especially those from Otterbein College and uh, this local congregation whose staff and helpers have willingly offered their ministry for this occasion. Please note that there is a reception that follows this event. We hope that you can stay. If you're here, if you're across the conference watching via live stream, uh, go to the kitchen. <laughs> At the reception, there will be refreshments and an opportunity for you to introduce yourself to our new bishop, Bishop Palmer, and his lovely wife of 36 years, Cynthia Palmer. Cynthia is a gift to this conference and one I've only gotten to know briefly thus far, but obviously has the same passion for Jesus Christ that her husband has and the unity of the two of them is obvious. I wanna highlight that in the first rows here on, uh, in front of the pulpit area is seated family and uh, special long-term friends. And I wanna give you special greeting at this time and glad you were able to be a part of this occasion. Some of you may not know, but Bishop Palmer's father is a retired United Methodist pastor Reverend Herbert Palmer, and in a moment you'll hear from him, and he will begin our call to worship. But first, I wish to introduce Reverend Rebecca Tollefson. Uh, she will first bring greetings from the ecumenical community. Good afternoon. I am the executive director of the Ohio Council of Churches, and you are members of the council. I appreciate the invitation to join with you this afternoon on this joyous celebration. The Ohio Council of Churches is made up of 18 Christian denominations which stretch across the state. There are 28 judicatories or regional bodies. And together, you with others, make visible the unity of Christ's church in Ohio. This represents approximately 3 million members and 6,000 congregations. From the Methodist Book of Discipline, Christian unity is founded on the theological understanding that through faith in Jesus Christ, we are made members in common of one body of Christ. Christian unity is not an option. It is a gift to be received and expressed. United Methodists respond to the theological, biblical, and practical mandates for Christian unity by firmly committing yourselves to the cause of Christian unity at local, national, and world levels. You invest yourselves in many ways by which mutual recognition of churches, of members, and of ministries lead to the sharing in Holy Communion with all of God's people. Knowing that denominational loyalty is always subsumed in our life in the Church of Jesus Christ, the Ohio Council of Churches welcomes and celebrates the rich experience of United Methodist leadership in church councils and consultations and multilateral and bilateral dialogues, as well as in other forms of ecumenical convergence convergence that have led to the healing of churches and nations. We see the Holy Spirit at work in making the unity among us more visible. As United Methodists, you participate with others in the council in giving a voice in the Ohio legislature on issues such as health care, immigration, redistricting, gun violence, and consumer protections. You partner with numerous organizations providing testimony on these and other concerns. 
You partner with others when disasters hit Ohio through Ohio voluntary organizations active in disaster. And you work alongside Ohio Interfaith Power and Light on Earth Stewardship. Christian unity and common mission give direction to us as we try to understand others as we hope to be understood. Congratulations to Bishop Palmer on his appointment in West Ohio. Welcome Bishop Palmer and Mrs. Palmer. My best wishes to you, sisters and brothers in Christ. Thank you. Good afternoon, my brothers and sisters in Christ. We greet you in the name of the matchless name of Jesus, and I count it a privilege and a pleasure to be here to celebrate with you this new beginnings of a partnership. We pray that God will bless this partnership, that it will be very rewarding, very enriching and productive, and certainly very enduring. I bring you greetings from the Eastern Pennsylvania Conference, uh, who, where Bishop Peggy Johnson is our Episcopal leader. We trust that this will be a joyful occasion and we're looking forward to all the proceedings. Will you please stand now with your bulletin in hand as we uh, turn to the call to worship. This is the day of new beginnings. God leads us into the future using leaders set apart to shepherd and to serve. Using people throughout the fabric of humanity with various abilities and gifts, hurry and grace. May we come before God in worship, seeking to be holy and acceptable for God's sight.
Let the community pray. God of the sparrow. God of the swirling stars. God of the rainbow. God of the empty grave. God of the hungry. God of the sick. God of the neighbor. God of the enemy. God of the ages. God of the hungry heart. We come to this moment of affirmation with grateful hearts that you have sent us your servants, Gregory and Cynthia Palmer. On this day, we raise them up before you with thousands of other United Methodists, with all the congregations, the food pantries, the hospitals and homes, the schools and universities, the churches in the countryside, the churches in the inner city, the congregations large and small, the wealthy and the poor. We lift before you the happy, satisfied, the disgruntled, the disagreeable ones, the generous, the wandering, and the selfish. God forgive us, but we do not want to leave anyone out. We want to be sure to lift us all before you, and we want the Palmers to know that their arms must be long and strong, loving and forgiving, arms that will wrap around each and every one of your children, those who have always been accepted and those who have been excluded, all nationalities, all colors, and especially those on the fringes. And in return, because God's love is always reciprocal, may we wrap our arms around Gregory and Cynthia so that they know they are loved and they are home among us. O oh God of the hills and the mountains, God who has set the oceans in their place and has declared thus far and not farther, God who cast the stars in the heavens to be companions of the moon and planets, God, we boldly call on you to show up today in this place. Embrace the Palmers and this whole conference. Together we are sure to experience many challenges, but many more miracles. Give wisdom, hope, guidance, and stamina to our bishop so that his presence here will be exactly what you had in mind when you called him to walk among us. We pray in the name of the one who died, but who came forth to live among us, Jesus, our hope and our redeemer. And the people said together, amen. amen.
have a reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
it's going to be all right. <laughs> I am Dennis Moeller, the superintendent of the Foothills District and the dean of the uh, West Ohio Cabinet. And I, along with Sherry Rogers, the uh, Foothills lay representative, have the honor of introducing Bishop Gregory Palmer to you this afternoon. We would like to open up the life of Bishop Palmer a little bit so that you can get to know he and his family a little bit better. Bishop Gregory Palmer was assigned to the West Ohio Conference as resident bishop at the 2012 Jurisdictional Conference recently held in July. He was born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He refers to himself as a child of the church and uh, you have met his father, the Reverend Herbert Palmer. Bishop Palmer's father is a retired United Methodist pastor and his mother, Charlotte Hewitt Palmer, was a school teacher. Bishop Palmer received his undergraduate degree from George Washington University in Washington, DC, and his Master's of Divinity degree from Duke Divinity School in Durham, North Carolina. He was an ordained deacon and probationary member in the Eastern Pennsylvania Conference in 1977, and was an ordained elder in full connection in the East Ohio Conference in 1981. His pastoral career includes pastorates in North Carolina and East Ohio. Bishop Palmer also served as district superintendent of the Youngstown District in the East Ohio Conference. In 2000, Bishop Palmer was elected to the Episcopacy by the North Central Jurisdictional Conference. He was assigned to the Iowa area where he served until assuming his responsibilities in the Illinois area. Bishop Palmer served as president of the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry from 2004 to 2008 and president of the Council of Bishops from April 2008 to May 2010. Bishop Palmer and his wife Cynthia are the parents of two children, Monica and Aaron. Monica is a middle school education teacher. She resides in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Aaron is employed at Impact Te Technologies and also resides in Charlotte. Mrs. Palmer is an honors graduate in religion from Duke University. She is a senior sales director with Mary Kay Cosmetics. She has served as the director of Christian education as staff of several community action agencies focused on welfare work projects. She is an outstanding student teacher of the scriptures and has a strong interest in women's leadership development. I first met Bishop Palmer three and a half years ago on a North Central jurisdictional trip to North Korea. It was for bishops and district superintendents and there was a group from West Ohio there. Bishop Palmer was the uh, president of the Council of Bishops at the time and because of that group you preached often. And my first recollection of Bishop Palmer was, this guy can preach. <laughs> and you will soon find that out. Since then, we have been trying to get to know each other um, on a fast track here these last couple of months. What I can say is that you will know when Bishop Palmer is in the house. You will know him by his presence when he enters the room. You will know him by his voice. Whether he is speaking or singing, you will know it is him. You will know him by his relational skills is the proper term, but he knows how to work a house. but you will remember him by his ability to bless you. We have gotten an opportunity, several opportunities over this last several weeks as a cabinet to work with Bishop Palmer and it is very apparent in very little time to know the themes that are important to him in the stories and in the way he conducts himself. It is very apparent that his family is very, very important to him. He talks often and relates to his family. It is apparent that he is one who seeks harmony 
to bring people together across the divides. We look forward to that, Bishop Palmer. And he is one that holds his God close to his heart. To say that he is spiritual is an understatement, but it is a part of his whole being and is reflected not just in his sermons, but in every time he shares. Sherry and I are humbled to be here today to introduce to the West Ohio Conference our new Episcopal leader and spouse, Bishop Gregory Palmer and his wife, Cynthia. Bishop Palmer, we greet you from the West Ohio Conference with all of the support that we can give and a future that we long for. On behalf of the North Central Jurisdictional Committee on Episcopacy, I do hereby certify that Bishop Gregory V. Palmer was duly elected a Bishop of the United Methodist Church at the 2000 North Central Jurisdictional Conference. Furthermore, at the, two, the 2012 Jurisdictional Conference, Bishop Palmer was assigned by our jurisdictional Episcopacy Committee to the Ohio West Area. It is my honor and privilege to present to the members and friends of West Ohio Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church our new Episcopal leader, Bishop Gregory V. Palmer. Bishop Palmer, you have been consecrated to be a shepherd and a servant. You have been assigned as our bishop on behalf of the laity of the West Ohio Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. We present to you these symbolic gifts. As District Superintendent of the Shawnee Valley District, I present to you this Bible. May you fearlessly proclaim the Word of God. As a lay representative, of Shawnee Valley District, I present to you this shell of water. Remind us, Bishop Palmer, to remember our baptismal faith. Bishop, as the District Superintendent of the Miami Valley District, I present to you this cup and chalice. May you keep us in communion with Christ and his beloved church. As a lay representative of the Miami Valley District, I present to you a book of discipline. We ask you to guard the faith, exercise discipline, seek unity, and supervise the work of the church. Bishop Palmer, it's an honor and privilege as the District Superintendent of the Ohio River Valley to greet you and to present to you a gavel. Preside at our annual conference with great strength and humility. And may you appoint and assign ministers to places that make and equip disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world.
As a lay representative of the Ohio River Valley District, I ask God to bless you, Bishop Palmer. We have asked a group of children to come forward and to ask us and to lead us in asking God to bless you as our new bishop. Thank you for this day, for Bishop Palmer and his wife, Mrs. Palmer, 
As we surround them with love and prayers, may we join hands and hearts to show and share Jesus' love together. Lord, give them comfort when they are missing their friends in Illinois and help new friends to be with them. Lord, strengthen Bishop Palmer for the many things you will call him to do. Lead each of us to find our own ways to bless Bishop Palmer and his wife with your love. We pray, Lord, that you'll make all of us to be helpers who are willing and able to work together to share the love of Jesus across our church in Westerville and all throughout the West Ohio Conference of the United Methodist Church. Amen. Let the church say amen again. Amen. Cynthia and I give thanks to God for this uh, awesome privilege and opportunity and the fact that uh, we're shaking in our boots. Don't let that throw you off one iota. But we are grateful to be here and have been grateful to serve in all of the parts of the vineyard where God has placed us and have uh, attempted in each place uh, to give it our all. But this afternoon, we are blown away by how much of your all you're giving under the leadership and guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so for all of you who have gathered and for those of you who are gathered across the World Wide Web, and for those of you who didn't see it while it was hot today, but will access the archive of this on YouTube, uh, I'm saying hi to you too, uh, but especially uh, to um, our team and uh, Pastor Jim here has put a wonderful service together. He's partnered up with uh, Pastor Randy Stearns, who is my executive assistant, and uh, they have worked and uh, gotten all the players in place, our communications office and all of these choirs of every age and of every description. 
Um, and I want you to know that as I began to process into the Lord's house, I felt myself trembling and quaking. And uh, I just want to give you a little commercial. Uh, they say that traditional worship is dead. And, um, and I'm neither for nor against anything if it's really the worship of God. But I want you to know if, uh, if we would start singing holy, holy, holy like that, uh, you know, it would, uh, it would put something into us and remind us that uh, we stand at every time and in every place uh, on the very edge of mystery and of the unseen but very real God who has disclosed God's self in Jesus Christ. So thank you, and I'm grateful to all of these who have participated in the liturgy, who have extended words of welcome and given uh, to us the signs of this ministry. Um, they did tell me I had to give them back, and um, so I, I didn't know what that was about, but um, <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, and, uh, but I, I assumed regarding the discipline it was because the O12 is coming out and uh, <laughs> there'll be a fresh one for me and all that, so. Uh, at any rate, I just, just check in the temperature of the place, and uh, I see you're, you're on point. You, um, you've had a chance to uh, meet uh, some of the members of uh, our family. My, my wife, uh, Cynthia, of course, who uh, was just uh, joining me here and surrounded by this wonderful chorus of children. And uh, I don't want to call them angels. I want to call them the children that they are. And um, I hope... Uh, Lisa, our communications director, we'll get that prayer that they sang up on the web. If we'd make that our prayer, uh, maybe we'd do a little better for the Lord and uh, to make this a, a different world um, and the world that God has already redeemed in Christ, but uh, not everybody's on board yet. And you know, that's really our job is to get folks on board with what God has already done in Christ. I heard an eloquent preacher, and it was not me, um, <laughs> who said um, that the decisive battle has been fought and the victory has been won at Calvary and in the resurrection. And then after a pregnant pause, this preacher said, but there are still a few minor rebellions against the dominion of King Jesus. Just turn on CNN and see if you see any rebellions against the dominion of King Jesus. So that's our job, is to help get folks on board with the yearning of this prayer that these children, rightly led, poured their hearts out to remind us of what is the heart of our mission. So thank you. And then um, as uh, Cynthia and I were uh, sitting there surrounded by them, I thought of other members of our family, my dad, whom you met, and uh, reference was made to uh, my now deceased mother uh, 22 years ago, but my father had the good fortune and uh, the good sense uh, to marry another beautiful woman, and uh, she's here, Sister Peggy Palmer is here. Just stand up, Peggy, and uh, let you greet her as well. And uh, my, uh, the other side of the family is represented as well. Uh, my wife's uh, sister from Philadelphia, one of three sisters, but uh, one came to uh, stand in the stead of all of them. Uh, Belinda Fields is here. And Belinda, would you stand, please? Thank you. Now, I'm not going to introduce everybody, but um, I want you to know I, I brought my crowd with me. And um, so, so, so go thou and do likewise uh, in your churches. But we do have some other members of our extended family, some cousins who are here, and they're seated severally here on the second and third pew. And if you just stand, now this is my Columbus crowd. So, so I, I have a posse in Columbus. Uh, yeah. So they, they go to some other churches, and uh, so if, you know, if things don't work out, you know, uh, I, got, I got some folks, so uh, I got, I'm, on, I'm on plan C already. <laughs> and um, also sitting with our family today is 
um, Dr. Maggie Jackson, who is uh, an outstanding laywoman from the East Ohio Conference, and also happens as the chair of the Jurisdictional Episcopacy Committee. And I know there are other uh, folks that are um, uh, here at our special invitation, and uh, we're grateful for your presence. You're scattered throughout the uh, auditorium, and all of us are here together uh, this afternoon for this uh, wonderful time of worship uh, in which we have been blessed already beyond measure. And so I ought to get at what I've been assigned to do, and um, I want to, in that spirit, invite you to a time of prayer. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Grant, O oh God, in these moments and in all the moments of our lives that the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts will indeed find acceptance in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Several years ago, a new Anglican bishop was being installed in the Diocese of Oxford in the Church of England, John Pritchard by name. And he began his ordination and installation sermon by telling a wonderful story that I have cherished and every now and again have called to mind and shared with other people. Especially on an occasion where everything is new and seems fresh and everyone is wide-eyed and hopeful. I can see the wide-eyedness of all of you this afternoon. And you can see my wide-eyedness, the fact that I don't know what I'm doing yet, notwithstanding, I'm wide-eyed. But that happens when new people come together, particularly in a new arrangement that got arranged by somebody else, meaning not everybody in the room feels the same amount of power and control about the arrangement. Some of you are saying, well, you didn't ask me whether Gregory Palmer ought to come to West Ohio. And I want you to know I wasn't asked either, but we're here. <laughs> we're here. Sometimes, even among people who know each other very well, there is a wide-eyedness, almost a blank stare. And so Pritchard tells this story of two women who happen to have been friends across decades. They traveled together. They shared ups and downs, joys and sorrows together. They had at least a weekly meeting in their ongoing years to play cards, to drink tea. I suspect to gossip a little bit, like all of us do when we're together with friends of long standing. And one of them says to the other, in what must have been an awfully quiet moment. She says to her friend of long standing, her card-playing travel companion, I hope you won't be angry with me. 
the silence deepens and becomes, I suspect, almost deafening. But then she says, could you remind me of what your name is? Her friend, after an appropriate silence, looks back into the face of this dear and cherished friend and says, how soon do you need to know? <laughs> so you're wondering, what kind of guy is this? What kind of bishop will he be? What kind of spiritual life does he have? What kind of leadership style is his? Is he relational or is he more aloof? Is he an introvert or is he an extrovert? Is he aligned with all of the lenses through which I see and understand the gospel and the history of the church. Will he be in support or op in opposition to my cause about which I'm most passionate? The list of your questions and the way in which you articulate them could go on and on and on and be assured I've got the same questions just flip the script. What kind of conference will this be? And the litany of specific questions goes on and on and on. But my response to you is in the question of this dear card-playing person. How soon? Do you need to know? But when I thought about that story from Bishop Pritchard and thought about this occasion that evokes all of that, who are you and who are we together and who will we be together and who have we been and wondered where the cherished things are and what the inside jokes are that you already have and you already know the punchlines to. There is a profound sense of mutuality in which we're not staring each other down as in a contest, but we are in a period of wonderment. And when I think about our situation in this newness, and think about this text and know something a little bit about the context into which Paul was speaking to the Corinthians, while the question of what kind of apostle will you be was not necessarily the driving question, and yet it was in the room also. Witness the regularity with which Paul, in his correspondence with the Corinthians, was always feeling a need to defend his apostleship. And with the Corinthians in particular, this colony, <laughs> this place filled with rich diversity, where there was no lack of ideas or charismatic leaders or of gifts and skill and energy, no lack of diversity, not only of ideas but of people, but of socioeconomic status and other aspects of social standing. Paul was trying to figure out, how can I stay on point and on message when I hear reported to me some of the things that I hear reported to me, some of which are enormous gifts, and some of which are things that make you go, hmm. And so Paul stakes out a little bit of a territory, and he says, amidst all of the diversity and difference and divergence and giftedness and possibility and opportunities for the future that God prefers 
for the church at Corinth. Here's what I want you to know. And he says something not only about the gospel, but about his convictions about the gospel and about what he hopes will be at the center of the gospel and the mission of the church for the Corinthians, and by extension, I say, for all others who will follow, follow after the crucified and risen Messiah. And he says, out of all of the things that I might say, and that I could have said, and that I could have let you know how much I know about some things. He said, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says, in fact, I believe that so deeply. I believe that that is such the heart and the core of the message and who we are called to be if we are to ever have a chance, I say, of answering the prayer in the affirmative of these children today. He says, in fact, I believe it so deeply that I did not come among you all gussied up and slicked back, too sure and confident of myself, even though I have great confidence in the message. He said, I came among you as one who was defined by weakness, by fear, and by trembling. You see, he's flipping the script on them. And God is always flipping the script on us. We think we know. But as Paul says in another place, we see through a glass darkly. We know in part, but we don't know the whole. There'll come a time when we know it. <laughs> when we'll see with great clarity. And I pray God when we look back in the light and the countenance of God and the clarity that only God in God's unhindered presence gives. Even the church, dare I say even the United Methodist Church, dare I say even the West Ohio Conference of the United Methodist Church, will look back in the light of that clarity and say, that's what God was trying to get us to see. What do you mean, Paul? What do you mean, Palma? To see that it wasn't about us after all. And it's only about us to the extent that we become conduits in the world for what God is trying to get accomplished which is nothing less than the redemption of the entire cosmos that we sometimes in our tradition call new creation. Where everything, everything, can't you hear Paul testify in his second correspondence? If anyone be in Christ, behold, all things old are passed away, and everything, everything, is made new. I understand that it is a legitimate interpretation of the Greek text. I'm dependent upon others here, but I trust them. To say that in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, not only are they made new, but the whole world becomes new. Do you know how serious the business is that we're in? <laughs> That one soul, one life, one mind, one pair of hands, one pair of feet, one body at a time surrendered at the foot of the cross makes the whole world new. It's no mistake. We are in the business of making disciples of Jesus Christ for 
the transformation of the world. We're in the business of commending the gospel to men, women, boys, and girls in order that they and the world might be made new. Paul says, I know you're looking for something more profound and more poetic and more rhetorically eloquent. And maybe you are too. But I stopped by this afternoon to tell you. I know one thing. Jesus Christ and him crucified. I know that the son of the living God named Jesus, Mary's baby, hung out on a cross one Friday afternoon, they say, was dead. And he was so dead and folks wanted everybody to know he was dead, that the emperor put his seal on the tomb. But I know that early Sunday morning, God, by God's miraculous and mysterious power, I don't know how, and I will not spend any time trying to figure out how, I know that God raised him from the dead. And that when he did, he raised me, and he raised you, and he raised you, and he raised you, and he's still in the business of giving new life. There's a wonderful church whose trajectory I have watched for a few years that in the essence, the short version of their mission statement says this, and it's captured my imagination. Jesus gives life, period. Next sentence, the rest is details. I don't know if that works for you, it does not say that the details aren't important, but it gets the juxtaposition of life giver and working out how to live that life in the right order. And Paul says, when you get that straightened around, if you just jump back a few verses, it doesn't matter if it was Apollos or Peter. Doesn't matter what your tribe is. Doesn't matter so much where you went to school or if you haven't been to any school at all. Doesn't matter whether you live in the high rent district or if you hope tonight to get into a homeless shelter, Jesus gives life. And the details that you and I have got to work out why are some of us living in high rent districts? Oh, look out now. Uh-huh. Because the life giver has not asked us to retreat from the world, but has given us life to throw ourselves into the world with reckless, unapologetic abandon, with a message in word and in deed. That Jesus gives life. So what kind of bishop will I be? I'm just going to give you a taste. It's a longer answer than you have time. And truth be told, and any bishop who says, 
Otherwise, you tell them they're not as truthful as they might be. I'm still figuring it out. But this I know. Jesus Christ and him crucified and raised from the dead. So what's all this weakness, fear, and trembling about, preacher? Don't be too overwrought by it. I think Paul was doing what I try to do when I read those words. If he wasn't, I'll own it for me. It's the humility to say I'm still figuring it out. It's the courage to say I don't know everything. But what I know is a heaven of a starting place. You thought I was going to say something else, but <laughs> that's in another church down the road they do that. <laughs> but don't be deceived. It's also a rhetorical device to draw the audience in and to set himself, in Paul's case, in contrast to all of those who think they have it all together. They're sure. We got so many sure people in our church. I don't have time to get on their case this afternoon, but they're sure about this, and they're sure about that. They're sure about things they ought to be sure about, and they're sure about your business too. Have mercy, Lord. All I know is they're sure they ought to be in a deodorant commercial. But this weakness and fear and trembling is about us, you and me together, the church, getting down on our knees. And like Jehoshaphat cried in 2 Chronicles, he'd gotten himself between a rock and a hard place. He was about to be decimated and obliterated, and he cried out, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes... <laughs> are fixed on you. So that's what really Paul is drawing us into. It's about the heart and the core. It's an invitation to the church to get our eyes fixed on Jesus. And let's face it, friends, we're easily distracted. We're easy. I, I am. If you're not, you know, I'll try to follow you then. But we're... <laughs> We're easily distracted. So this weakness, fear, and humility is about the right gaze in the right direction on the right one who is himself the Lord of the church. It is about posturing ourselves in relationship to the gospel and the mission with the utmost of humility, vulnerability, and transparency. It is about trust and hear this now, radical insecurity. Work with me, I ain't going to be long. It's not about technique. It's not about charisma at the end of the day. But it's about prostrating ourselves at the foot of the cross and saying from here we derive our life and we see our model for living the life that the crucified and risen Messiah has given to us. This is not about retreating from the world. It's about, as the young people would say, going correctly to the world. Because the world, outside of the life of the church, they know when it's become about us and not about another. They know when our primary agenda is our own institutional preservation and not the redemption of the world. They know when we're worried, laying clergy alike, hear me well, 
about our privileges and entitlements. Oh, am I in the house this afternoon? I'm not going to tell it all today, but they know. They know. And so it is about standing again before the mystery of God's love incarnate in Jesus Christ and the gospel that shakes us up from the inside out, subverts all of our presuppositions, and turns us right side up and faces us in the right direction, which is always to be faced out to the world. We don't come to gatherings like this to gaze at our own ecclesiastical and spiritual neighbors. They don't look that good anyway. <laughs> but we come in here to inhale and to feel and to sense the mystery of God's love for us again and renewed and refreshed by that love and that power. We go out into the world to join God in God's movement and God's reign which has already been inaugurated in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I said it's not about technique and charisma. There's another wonderful Anglican bishop. I'm not an Anglican. I'm a United Methodist, but uh, Bishop Stephen Cottrell of the Diocese of Chelmsford, has a wonderful book entitled Hit the Ground Kneeling. And the whole book, based upon various excerpts from the Proverbs, is devoted to subverting all of our notions about leadership. You've heard it said, as you might gather from the title, that we tell people going into a new situation, hit the ground running. He says, I'd just like to tweak that a little bit. What if we started on our knees? <laughs> In another chapter, he subverts the notion that leaders need thick skin. Hmm. Boy, I've heard that one a lot. Toughen up, suck it up, man up, woman up, whatever. You got to have thick skin. And he says, what if the goal of servant Christian leadership was to have thin skin? Because thick skin might make you indifferent to the voices and the needs of others. But thin skin opens you to God's grace and to the needs of all of those around you. Well, you may, might, you may want to invest in it. Go to Cokesbury, they'll get it for you. I know it'll be easy to order it on Amazon. Nothing against Amazon, I have an account, but they don't contribute to worn out Methodist clergy. <laughs> Not that I have any interest in that, but uh, so not with eloquence, not with wisdom to outdo all of those around me, but in weakness, in fear, and trembling at the very threshold of the gospel. Jesus talked about that kind of vulnerability. Those of you that preached the gospel lection this morning or heard some preaching about it. Mark 8, 
take up your cross. If any of you want to be my followers, take up your cross and follow me. And then this subversive phrase, those who seek to save their lives will lose them. But those who lose their lives for my sake and the gospel, and here's my twist on it, they'll find more life than they can live. Subversion of our notions. Everything about us says preserve yourself. Take care of yourself. Protect yourself. It's a bad, bad world out there. And here's Jesus saying, I need you out here, Palmer. Take up your cross and follow me out of the church doors into the world. Because if you really want to have life and meaning and purpose, and oh, here's the, the word of the decade, significance. Take up your cross. And aren't you, glad, aren't you glad that your Savior and mine, it wasn't just nice, pious words. But when the time came, <laughs> he bore the cross. And we'll come in a few moments to the holy meal and we'll remember his self-giving for us. Listen to the vulnerability on the night that he was betrayed. When his closest friends and associates, those of you that are looking for warm fuzzies in this thing, it's a good thing if you can find it. But Jesus said you got to keep going anyhow. <laughs> On the night in which his closest friends turned their backs on him, he took bread. He broke the bread after he blessed it. And he gave it to them. And he said these words that you'll hear again. This is my I give my life to you and for you. And the only question left for us is whether or not we really want to follow that Jesus. There's some other versions of him out there, you know. Go with Jesus, you'll have it made in the shade. There's a health and wealth heresy on every corner if we're not careful. But the master said, take up your cross and follow. I got more to tell you, but you can't bear it today. <laughs> and after all, we've got at least four years. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let the church say,
together to approach the table. It is but a small hint of the great banquet feast. And we are reminded that all are invited without condition and without reservation. We know that we are not deserving, but God has kept covenant with us, yet we have not been so steadfast. So we pause to confess our sins in the quiet of our own souls. is not the last word. Brokenness is not a permanent state. In God's mercy, there is forgiveness. In God's grace, there is restoration. In God's love, there is community. Hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, into the void and formless darkness, you spoke your word of creation. Let there be light. And there was day and night, sun and moon and the stars shining into the darkness. As your people journeyed toward the promised land through the wilderness, you guided them shining into the dark of the night as a pillar of fire, and all through time, your light, O God, has directed us along your way. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. For though you would be light to our darkness, we have not always chosen to walk with you. In our rebellion, we have preferred the shadows. In our willfulness, we have turned away from your brightness. In our sinfulness, we have closed our eyes and our hearts to the light of your love. Yet, you insisted in coming among us into the world in Jesus, the light shining into the darkness which could not be overcome. In Jesus, who was light shining into the hearts of all people, in Jesus, who is for us the very light of life. <clears throat> Standing in that light, we remember that on the night before he died, Jesus shared a meal with his friends. He took bread, offered a blessing over it, broke it and shared it around the table, saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. As the meal was coming to an end, Jesus took a cup. Again, he offered a blessing over it and shared it with his friends, saying, Take this and drink from it, all of you, for this is the cup of a new covenant made as I give my life for you, a covenant of forgiveness and grace for all people. And he left them with a reminder, Do this always in remembrance of me. And so we do remember as we gather at the table, as the sun shines through the darkness, as the stars light the night sky, or as a small candle flickers gently in a quiet room, we remember this mighty work of God in coming among us as the light of the world and the great gift of Christ's offering for us that by this light we too, in holy mystery, become light for the world. All this we remember as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us all that Jesus offered, light, life, forgiveness, grace, God's own self for each of us. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, the light of the world, that we might be light for the world's darkness and grace for the world's brokenness, one with each other that we might shine all the more brightly and one in mystery to all ministry to all the world that darkness might never again be found in any corner of the earth and all people might live in the light of your love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, forever and ever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the people of the light, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. there is one loaf, we though many are made one in Jesus Christ. The bread which we break is a real sharing in the very body of Jesus Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a real sharing in the blood of Jesus Christ. Please know that this is the table of the Lord and is open to all. And as one brilliant poet and hymn writer said, Jesus spreads the table. Come and dine. Come and dine, my sister. Come and dine. Come and dine, my brother. Come and dine. Jesus spreads the table. Come and dine. Your servers are moving to their stations now. And uh, when they get in readiness, the ushers will guide you that you may receive these precious gifts of God.
Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have fed us in the sacred sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly feast prepared for all of your people. Faithful God, in baptism, you have adopted us as your children, made us members of the body of Christ, and chosen us as inheritors of your kingdom. We thank you that in this sacred meal, you renew your promises with us. Empower us by your spirit to witness and to serve, and send us out as disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you that you graciously feed us, who have duly received these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. By this, you assure us of your favor and goodness toward us. We are incorporated into the mystical body of your Son, the blessed company of all faithful people. We are heirs through hope of your everlasting kingdom. By the merits of Christ's precious death and passion. Assist us with your grace that we may continue in that holy fellowship and walk in goodness the way you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ our Lord to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Together we've celebrated this day of new beginnings as Bishop Gregory Palmer comes to shepherd us into God's preferred future. O oh God, who knows our name and calls each of us to ministry, we give you thanks this afternoon for raising up among us your faithful servant Gregory for the ministry of a bishop of your church. We pray blessings upon Cynthia that you will continue to uphold her in every way. And we pray too, O oh God, that you join all our hands in your hands so that we might touch this bruised world with your healing balm. Let us pray boldly for the breaking in of God's kingdom in our world today. Holy Spirit, we pray for revival. Together we've gathered to hear your holy word proclaimed through the prayers and songs of your people. Let us praise the God of the covenant. Let us exalt God's name together. May we join in the singing until the darkness is filled with stars and the wolf lies down with the lamb in everlasting shalom. Holy Spirit, we pray for revival. Together we've gathered at Christ's table, and we are filled and nourished with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Jolt our lives to turn and remember the amazing story once more, that God would become one of us, living among us, teaching us, sitting down at table with us, breaking bread and sharing the cup with us, and then dying among us, for us. Holy Spirit, we pray for revival. Together we've gathered to remember your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Remember them, O oh God, the ones who cry for mercy. Remember them, O oh God, the ones in harm's way. Remember them, O oh God, the ones who have so little. Remember them, O oh God, the sick and the dying. Remember them, O oh God, the frail of body and the fragile of spirit. Remember them. Remember us. Hear our prayers and create within us a fire to do your will, to do justice, love mercy, to live in humility in your righteousness. Holy Spirit, we pray for revival. Together we have gathered as Christ's church. John Wesley said, set your heart firm on God and on other things only as they are in and from God. We pray for Christ's church, a church not of agendas and committees, but a church whose task it is to shine light and tell good news into the dark. Holy God, teach the heart of each person gathered here this afternoon and on each church congregation, restoring all to renewed hope alive in our living God. Keep us one body in Christ, one community of believers, one family of faith. Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, we, we pray, pray for, for revival. revival.
God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.